Wonderful. So again, thank you all for being here. Um, and now that we're officially underway, I'm going to go ahead and toss it to Luke Safford. Many of you know Luke. Um, for those of you that don't, Luke is the Director of Education and Engagement here at Tucson Audubon. Um, he's an incredible birder, um, longtime employee here on staff, and uh, he's going to teach you a lot of, a lot of great things today. So um, with that, I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to Luke. Right on. Thank you, Donito. Really appreciate it. Good to see all of you guys. Um, this first uh, of a set of three of series, uh, brand new to birding. So there's a there's a lot that goes into birding. Actually, there's a lot and there's also a little. So it's, you know, you, you kind of take it as far as you want. Um, but, you know, the great thing about being new to birding is that you just, uh, you see things from a totally different perspective and become aware of all sorts of different things in nature that are happening around you. So we'll, we'll definitely, we'll talk about some of the, some of the things to be mindful of when you first start noticing birds and, um, how to move forward in that. Also, uh, want to invite you to, uh, come and join me on a couple different field trips that are specific to, uh, beginning birding and brand new to bird, the brand new to birding class. It'll only be these two trips will only be, uh, it'll be invite only. So in the follow-up email, you'll see a couple different links with possibilities of joining me and uh, probably Peggy Steffens is going to help me on the first one and someone else will help me on the second one. But we'll go to Sweetwater or Fort Lowell and you can kind of join it. As you'll see, one of the main things about getting into birding and learning about what it means to to be aware of birds is just being out there, immersing yourself and being with other people. So we'll get into it here real quick, but Hey, I just want to remind you all it is election day. So I hope that you guys have w went out and voted. Um, I sent my, it, mine in by mail a couple of weeks ago. My wife has been sitting on the table for, uh, weeks and I keep reminding her vote and vote. And so finally she filled it out this morning and took it to the thing. I, I had, I had very little hope that she would actually do it, but she did. So I was glad for that hope you guys do too uh also have you guys heard about the candidate who's stealing ballots from the election boxes has anyone heard about that what yeah they're stealing nope. ballots from the election boxes and i just want to say they've got my vote <laughs> that's a bad joke i have this dad joke calendar that my daughter got me and that was the oh no so they got my vote <laughs> maybe, maybe some of it i don't know how it landed it landed better with the shop volunteer out here, but anyhow, yeah. let's get started with brand new birding. <laughs> Enough dad jokes. Um, I so I got into birding from my grandparents back when I was like six years old. Uh, they it's actually my cousin's grandparents, and I would go over there uh, before school. Um, before my my mom would take me to school, and so I was just a little kid, and I over there before school and I had breakfast with them and they had a little scope that was trained out on the lake that they lived on and some bird feeders and I would just um you know sit there with grandma Eileen and grandpa and look at birds and shoot that got me into it when I was like six years old so um I guess that that's like 30 over 35 years ago uh so just um have gone through like different times in my life where I've gone out birded a lot other times not as much but one of the, my favorite things about birding is getting other people into looking at birds this is my friend daniel clark we took a we um met each other in 2017 uh at sweetwater on accident uh it was like his first time to go birding with a friends and i was there separately and we kind of ran into each other i think we had a tennessee warbler or um chestnut side of warbler there at Sweetwater. Anyways, we hit it off. And then just like a year later, we did this big road trip to Texas together. This is where he got his picture with this tricolored heron in the background. But it's just like, it's really cool to you, birding gets you to meet people and the people that you already know, getting them into birds. Like it's, it's a very people oriented type of hobby uh, as well, I think. And so that's something that becomes really apparent as you get into uh, bird watching. Um, 
the first thing that I want to just share. So we're going to, there's going to be, I think nine, I think nine different little um, things I want to share with you today. So nine, um, nine tips, if you put it that way, nine tips about being new into birding, what to expect or what to think about. And um, the first one is what, really this. Don't worry about identifying everything that you see. Uh, this little fly catcher here, uh, it's a Hammond's fly catcher. It's got kind of longer uh, wings. Uh, it had a chip note that kind of sounded like a Hammond's fly catcher. It was in the winter. It was at Rio Vista Natural Resources Park. This is this is this is a tough bird to identify. You're going to run into these tough birds. Some of some birds are tougher than others. A wood duck, like we talked about, like it just stands out. Like it's doesn't even seem real. It has all these colors, makes it a little bit easier to identify. But uh, you know, a lot of the birds are gray, brown, different shades of gray and brown. This one uh, having a little yellow on the on the belly, a little bit of an eye ring. But all these Impidinax flycatchers have a little bit of yellow and a, a bit of an eye ring. So they're just like really tough. And so some of us, when we, and even those of us who are been birding for a long time, we get really hung up and sometimes frustrated, sometimes stressed about like, Hey, I don't know what this bird is. And it just can kind of be really intimidating. Hey, here's the thing. When it comes to birding, it's just about enjoying the birds. So really if, uh, I don't know how many of you here already identify yourself as a birder. Uh, I know people who say, well, I, you know, I like birds, but you know, I'm not, I'm not a birder. Well, I would say that's false because really the, my definition of a birder is anyone who enjoys birds and looks at them. So if you look at, at birds, you enjoy them, you're a birder. Don't, and here the, the, really the main thing, don't be frustrated. There's nothing about this hobby that should be frustrating nothing about this hobby that should be, um, you know, stressful or anything like that. So just enjoying the birds. Here are some of the different fly catchers that Hammond's fly catcher, dusky fly catcher, gray, gray fly catcher. You can see this is from a Sibley bird guide. We'll talk about bird books here real quickly because they are uh, important and they can be fun too. But you can see just how like all these fly catchers pretty much look the same. They have habitat um, little descriptions of like where they breed. So like, that's another good indicator, but don't worry about identifying all these, like, especially if you're right, brand new into it, uh, just getting it to, uh, Hey, it, it looks like a fly catcher. Man, that's a, that's a great first big step of seeing this bird and saying, Oh, that's a fly catcher. Um, that's a, that's, that's, that's an important first step and just, um, don't worry about identifying it. Uh, I do, I, I love putting together lists and I'll talk about eBird in a little bit. eBird is this huge database of lists that Cornell lab, uh, cultivates that all sorts of nature lovers input the bird sightings that they see into. So this is one of the lists that I put together. I have sap sucker species on there, possibly female Williamson's. I didn't get a good enough look at it. Uh, and, um, I didn't feel compelled to have to identify it. I just put it as sap, sap sucker species. So um, that's one of the first things that I just really want to pass along to all of you is don't worry about identifying everything that you see to species. There's some really tough ones out there. Mallard and Mexican duck are really similar. can be really difficult. Uh, different sparrows can be very difficult. Don't worry about that. Uh, you do have, there are a lot of resources out there to help you think through like and identify birds that, that, I mean, let's face it, we don't have to identify everything, but that's part of what gets us into it is that we do, we, we have that kind of desire to like know what something is, to give it a name. I mean, it's just like naming a child, like it, it, there's something important about names and you want to know what they are. And, um, so while we don't need to identify everything, there are some resources, bird books out there that you can, um, purchase or have that, that help you. Some of them are, are better than others. Some of them give you different insight than others. I just thought I'd go through a, a couple different, 
of my favorite bird books um, that are um, good for here in South Southeast Arizona. You can see some of these books here. There's birds of Costa Rica. There's birds of Southern Africa. But there's uh, let's just talk about uh, the birds right here in Southeast Arizona. So my favorite bird book is the Sibley, the Big Sibley. Uh, it's the one that I go to, like I have, I have here next to me at my desk here at the office. I have one next to my desk at my office at home. Uh, sometimes I'll carry one in my car. Uh, this is, there's a big one that has like East and West, uh, birds of North America. So one thing you'll notice, like, um, when you first get into learning birds and of the area, you'll notice that there are a lot of birds that are just here in the, the Western United States. And then a whole nother set of birds that are in the Eastern United States. So like we'll have black headed gross beak. So like the West version of Sibley will focus on black headed gross beak and the East version of, of the Sibley will focus on rose breasted gross beak. So it's the, the two species are really similar but they are kind of divided by the Rocky mountains. Um, so that's kind of the difference between the West and East versions. They, um, focus on different birds. Now, some of us, uh, are snowbirds and we, uh, spend our summers in Wisconsin and our winters in Arizona. And so having the big Sibley, having the, the comprehensive, uh, detailed one with all of those birds in it is probably the best bet. If you don't plan on doing any travel over east, you just get the west one and it's a little bit smaller because these this bird guy can get pretty thick. Um, it has a lot more like heavy descriptive stuff. So like this is a uh, from the big Sibley and the page of all the hummingbirds. Holy cow, it gets like really detailed. You can see here's all different female hummingbirds and just you can look at their postures and you can see how their bill shapes are different. You can see um, just like the length of their wings. That can be something. You can see how their wing shapes are over here on the right. This right here is like their hummingbird displays. So like a broad tail will just swoop up like that. While other ones kind of have like a up and down, up and down like this Rufus or Ruby throated is more like a U. Um, so like this Sibley is like really detailed. It's not one that you want to like pack out as you're like hiking or walking around or anything there's another one that's another guide that's smaller a little bit easier to carry around with you and is also to all the birds of of the united states this is the kaufman field guide um and so it's it's not in um taxonomic order so taxonomic being the way that the um uh the bird people dictate how they're supposed to, you know, be in order. <laughs> the Kaufman guide doesn't really pay as much attention to that. He, he tries to put it together in a more, um, it's like a, someone who's just getting into birding, like a logical kind of order a little bit. Um, and so it's pretty easy to use. Uh, he, I think he does a good job of pointing out key characteristics. So this is like a combination of, drawings and pictures and then so he has a picture and then he kind of um shapes it a bit to be able to see some of the key marks so this is the kingbird page you can see pointing at the the bill of uh tropical or couches kingbird pointing at the the white chin patch of the cassins kingbird so those sorts of things um it's you know they they all have these range maps and of course the sibley does as well but I find that this is a pretty, pretty good field guide. The cool thing about this one too, is I really like Ken Kaufman and top secret. Don't tell anyone else this. I haven't really told anyone, but Ken Kaufman is going to be one of our featured speakers for the festival next year. So there, there's another, there's a little tidbit for you. Um, but these Kaufman guides are pretty, pretty nice. They have, he has uh guides, not just for birds, but for other animals too. Um, but I like the pictures that he uses. And then if we want to get um, even a little bit more dis, um, focused just on Southeast Arizona, one that's really small, this Birds of Southeast Arizona by, by Rick Taylor is a really nice one. It's easy to carry, fits in your pocket. 
um, here's the Kingbird page. He uses pictures. So just the pictures and you see, um, you know, it shows most of the markings that you want to see on there, but not as, um, in depth with the markings as the other two books that we just saw. One cool thing is that he does have like what elevation you would expect to see it in. And it's very Southeast Arizona specific. So that's pretty neat too. So we carry these in our nature shop, by the way. So a little plug there, but a reminder right from the beginning, this is the main thing I want to leave all of you with. If there's, I mean, there's gonna hopefully there's some other stuff that you'll learn throughout this talk, but the main thing, just have fun. Like birding is meant to be fun. It's a hobby. It's not life or death. It's just uh, going out there looking for birds. This is me and my son uh, down in, um, in between Empalme and Wymus down in Sonora. And uh, we're out there looking at, it looks like we have some brown pelicans off here on the right on the pier. There's a bunch of different shorebirds and stuff along the edge. But, you know, if I may, it, my son, uh, he wants to identify everything and, you know, sometimes it's, it's frustrating for him, but like, it's just trying to tell him, don't worry about identify everything. Just have fun. Just soak it in. I mean, that's, that's the beauty of birding is that it's peaceful. It's just, uh, getting in tune with where you're at and yeah, identify what you can. And then here's the thing. Sometimes when you identify birds, you identify, I'll put it in quotes, identify birds is you're going to get some wrong. Hey, no sweat off the back. Don't worry about it. Like you're going to get some wrong. It's just, that's what's going to happen. Especially if you do try to identify everything, Hey, you're definitely going to get some wrong then. And sometimes that can, um, uh, if any of you use eBird and you, um, you identify a bird and then it asks for like notes or anything like that. And you're like, Oh man, I'm for sure going to get a something written back to me from the eBird reviewer. I hope I don't get this wrong. Maybe I won't even submit it. Oh man. Don't, don't put yourself in that position. Don't worry about it. So this is a, um, a dark eyed Junko. I knew that for sure. I knew for sure. This was a dark eyed Junko. And now what I was like trying to figure out is subspecies and I should have just let well enough be, be I should have just let it, let it go and tried not to identify it as subspecies. And so I, I, I believe I put this as a pink sided when actually uh, it's a female organ junco. And so I put it as pink sided. And of course I get a follow-up email from the eBird reviewer. We can read that. This is back in 2020. This is from the eBird reviewer, Molly, Molly Pollock. She's a super nice lady, but you know, these eBird reviewers can be like intimidating for us. Remember, it's a hobby. It's birding. It's meant to just be fun, peaceful and relaxing. Don't stress about it. So I get this, this, this email back. She says, thank you for being part of eBird to help make sure that eBird can be used for scientific research, blah, blah, blah following up with you and then she writes this photo looks like an organ junko <laughs> so there's two ways there, there's different ways that i could take this email and go with it i could be like oh man i suck like i can't believe i got that wrong i'm just not gonna submit anything more to ebird or i could be like no i i don't think that's an organ junko i think that's pink sided i think this uh ebird reviewer is wrong and i could fight it or I could just like face reality and just be like, oh yeah, Molly's right. I got it wrong. No sweat. No big deal. Um, and that's the way that we should always take it. So if you see a bird and you put it in your eBird thing and you're like, oh man, I got to make marks for it. Um, and you're intimidated by it. Just strike that. Just start your thinking over and just be like, all right, well, if I get this wrong, I'll just look at it as a learning experience. And that's really what we got to do. So being brand new to birding, remove any intimidation that comes with it. Uh, just have fun. Uh, you know, see this as a, as a way to learn. I mean, that's one reason why we get into birding anyways. We want to learn. We want to grow. 
Um, that's hopefully at all, all of life, but don't worry about identifying everything. And then if you do get some wrong, just know that you're in the same boat as everyone else. All right. Now let's get to some other things talking about learning and growing. I believe I, there, we could read all the books that we want. We could look at all the siblings. We could read, you know, all the, uh, the Peterson guides. We could take all the Crosley field guys and look at all the different cool pictures he has in there, but it's not until we actually get out and get out into the field when we really start experiencing something um, like real. Okay. So I believe that you really learn and grow best when you're out there experiencing, immersing yourself in the adventure of birding. And so that's why I like as much as we can pass along to each other virtually like this, like nothing really uh, gets you out learning about what it means to be a birder or bird watching and being outside and experiencing it together. And so that's one that's one reason why I want to offer these couple different field trips to get us out. One to Sweetwater, uh, I believe on the 17th, and then one to Fort Lowell Park on Tuesday the 21st. And uh, those are open to anyone. You'll get those uh, links in the uh, follow-up email. But I'd love for you to join me out there because there's nothing like just experiencing it in person. Um you know, th this is a picture of me down in Sycamore, Sycamore Canyon. Uh, that dark eyed junco was Sycamore Canyon in the, um, in the Catalinas. This is Sycamore Canyon down in the Pajaritos, west of Nogales, which by the way, is one of the coolest locations ever to go. You got to get down. If you're able to get down to Sycamore Canyon in the Pajaritos, west of Nogales, it's, is the most scenic place you've ever been. Maybe maybe only second to uh, South Fork Cave Creek outside of Portal. That's a beautiful spot too. Um, but yeah, so um, heading out here and being out in the field that that is the best way. And it, there's not really much else you got to say about that other than like be outside, get outside, and immerse yourself in it. Immerse yourself in the sounds. Immerse yourself in the sights. And then um, what I find really really important as as someone who's uh, even birded for 35 plus years. The best way that I learn about birds and their uh, activity and what kind of species they are and just about bird life in general is going to the same place and going there often. So I call this finding your patch. And then I think it's a, a really cool thing to, to bird it weekly. You get to know the rhythms of everything. This is me at at, at my favorite patch is Sweetwater Wetlands. And um, want to say, I'm going to do a new share. I'm going to take you over to eBird for a second. All right. So here's, here is my eBird page. And um, you can see I had quite a, submitted quite a few checklists here in Arizona, 1800 or so. And so I'm going to click on the complete checklist here. And so you can see all the different places that I've uh, birded lately and uh sweetwater of course the first couple on here but let me show you how many times i've gone to sweetwater since i moved here at the end of 2014 so let's say i started birding it in january of 2015 so what's that 15 16 that's uh that's a lot of years how many times have i been there any any guesses for how many times i've birded sweetwater wetlands starting in january 2015 any guesses? What yeah. do you think, Danito? How many times have I been there? 350. I hear 350. I'm going to say 500 plus. All right. Let's see. I actually don't even know. Let's find out. 490. 490. So you were real close. If you hadn't said the plus, you would only have been like, I mean, I guess you saw it as 10 off. So 490 times since January of 2015. I believe that was my first one. I think let, let's, uh, let's look here. Let's show all of them. So, and I try to get there every week. Sometimes when I'm on vacation or something, I, I, I miss some or, 
sometimes I'm there two or three times a week. And my first one was actually January 1st, 2015. And it looks like I went there twice that day. <laughs> I remember doing that with Brock. I think I had a black and white warbler there. But um, yeah, so this is a place you can see. I go there just about every week. And um, so what's happened within that that time frame is like, I can go to... I can go to Sweetwater now almost with, with my eyes closed. I can be like, all right, I bet there's an Abert Stowey over there. All right, we're going to go over here and see a Song Sparrow. All right, if we go over to this corner, we might, that's going to be our best chance for Pyroluxia. Oh, let's go to this edge of this pond and maybe that's a spot where we can get a Sora. And so you just begin to know all that stuff. But shoot, when I was birding the area in, in Mar let's just say March of 2015. Like I had, I had no idea. Um, and so like you just, you begin to learn these different things. Like um, it, it's just really awesome. I think it's one of my favorite things. So before I moved to Arizona, I had, I had a different patch and let's go to uh, let, uh, I'll show you my other patch was see that pop off trail along the Yakima river in Washington state. And so I, I looks like I only had 130 checklists for there, but you can, and I went there once after a couple of times after I moved, but you can see, I went there just about every week there too, October. Yeah. Um, so, but, you know, begin to learn where the black cap chickadees were at along, like, all right, around this bend, it's going to be our best spot for black cap chickadee or, Hey, let's go off on the side trail you get a really good look at the river and that's where you can see spotted sandpiper and so each one of us each one of us has like a park or a trail or something that's close by to us where we can start calling that our patch and just start start going there cool thing about ebird is that they even have like a, a patch function so if you go to explore here in ebird and you scroll down a bit you can see patch totals right here on the right and you click on patch totals and see i have i have four different patches the yakima greenway this is where that pop-off trail is at so that was the first patch i created I have a Sweetwater Columbus Park area, so that that area right around Santa Cruz River, around Sweetwater and Christopher Columbus Park, and then I have a, a five MR challenge that's five mile radius from where I live, and a seven and a half mile radius patch. So that's seven and a half mile radius from where I live that I keep track of the different birds that I see in those areas. Um, but you know, think here's this is part of your homework and we'll hit this at the very end too but part of your homework is identifying the place around your house around the place where you live where you could try to get in a rhythm of going there and learning the birds and uh, whether it's a walk along the Rito river or whether it's uh going to um you know whatever park it is but th that's how you're going to learn you're, you're not going to learn as much reading, finding birds in Southeast Arizona field guide. You're going to learn by actually being out there and going to that same place. And don't look at it as like uh, monotonous, but look at it as like you're, you're learning the, the, the pattern. So when do the white crowned sparrows come back to your patch? When do they leave? And um, it's, it, it, it teaches you. And then, and then as you learn that, it enables you, it gives you a little bit more uh, of a foundation to be able to share that with other people too. Any, any questions leading up to this part right here? Uh, open it so we're about halfway through. So any, any questions that we might have over some of this? Yeah, go ahead and mute Luke. So we're not echoing everybody. Uh, yeah, I've got a, a couple of questions real quick. Um, well, first off, just in case everybody's not seeing um, the chat, um, the author of that Finding Birds in Southeastern Arizona is um, Richard Taylor, Richard Caker Taylor, um, if you want to look that up. Um, and then the two questions that we have is uh, the first one's from Gary. Um, and he asks, he says, hi, Luke, if I wanted to photograph kingfishers, 
Does eBird have something where I can key in Kingfishers and find where they are closest to Phoenix and or Tucson? Yes, most most definitely. So this won't be an eBird class. Uh, we have some classes that are specifically, you know, designed to help navigate through that whole system because it's, um, oh, I, I could spend all day going through eBird. But yes, most definitely. So I'll do that. I'll show you how to do that here real quick. So first, I'm going to take you to the front page of eBird just so everyone can kind of have a, a feel. And remember, this is a um, a huge database put on by Cornell Lab of Ornithology. All these different birders keep their list of when they go to like Sweetwater or go to Fort Lowell or go to wherever and put them into this database and it collects all of it. And you can just search for anything you want. So this is the front page. You can go to, I would go to explore. So you hit explore. And if you're looking for Belt of Kingfishers in the Phoenix area. That's that's what I heard. So let's go to um, the best way is species maps. So right here, click on species maps. You get the whole world. This is not just an Arizona thing. This is a whole world thing. You type in the species name, Belted Kingfisher. Click on it. It's going to bring up all the Belted Kingfisher sightings anywhere in the world. The purple areas and the darker the purple is where most sightings have been inputted. So you can see it's a very North American bird all over North America, all the way down into uh, Northern South America, up into Alaska. And what you do here is you can use this little plus sign to go in, or I'm just using my mouse to scroll in deeper to specifically Phoenix, Arizona. And so I'm coming in here and as you get in, it's going to get rid of the purple and it's going to have these little blue or red uh, little balloons that show where the sightings are at. All right, here we go. So let's say that you live uh, in the kind of Gilbert area. And so you're, you're looking around, oh, where's Belt of Kingfisher seen? So all the red ones are one are points where it's been seen in the last 30 days. The blue ones past 30 days. So they're older. So you'd want to just zoom into the area that you want to explore. Click on a red balloon. Higley and Ocotillo Roads ponds. You can see that there's one scene there on October 23rd. And uh, this little text box here means that they wrote something in there about it. And the camera shows that they took a picture of it there. So you can click on Pierre's list here and you'll have a picture of a belted kingfisher along with some other birds here. Dunlin, well, there's the kingfisher. And so you can kind of get an idea of where you might go to find some of those bird species. Good question. All right, I've got a couple more. Um, so Deanna asks, can your quote unquote patch um, be your backyard? Um, they've got two, they've created a, basically a bird sanctuary um, kind of for their daughter. They got two acres. Uh, so they're seeing a ton of birds. So their next next step is just learning the idea, but they're just kind of wondering, can your backyard qualify as your patch? Heck yeah. Heck yeah, I can. I think that's, that's a great way to do it. I, I live right in town and uh, don't have a very big yard, but if I had a, like a, a yard like that, that, you know, you could spend some time in definitely that should, that could should and could and should, uh, be your patch. And, um, eBird has another cool function called yard totals right next to patch totals, but yard totals, and you can like have your yard, submit your yard as, as, um, an eBird yard. And so you can see mine and right here, uh, I've got like 80 checklists for my yard. I, I guess I have a lot more checklists for Sweetwater. <laughs> but then you can see how your yard ranks with other people who have their yards in here. It's kind of, you know, if you're 
if you want to compare. Sometimes it's not always good to compare or it would be as um, competitive. But I would say that the having birding from your yard is like a really, really good thing to do. Wonderful. Um, so we got another question from Melanie who's asking, do riparian areas tend to have richer bird life than open desert habitats? Most definitely. So anywhere that there's water, you're going to have, um, you're going to have more birds. Uh, so like case in point, like if you go out to Saguaro National Park, in fact, here, we can just, we'll, sh we'll show this by eBird actually. Whoop. Let me go back here. Oh, I got to share the right thing here. If I can figure it out. Anyway, my my screen isn't showing up right. But anyway, so yeah. So if you go out to Saguaro National Park and you do a list out there, you'll get... Um, You'll get some, you know, some really good quality birds. You get black throated sparrow, gilded flicker, black tailed gnatcatcher. You'll get a list of about probably you could see fifteen to twenty species, right? If you go to like Patagonia Lake State Park and you walk along the pathway along uh, the birding trail at the end, you're going to have a richer, more variety of species. And a lot of it has to do with water, has to do a lot with food resources getting the mixture of waterfowl and other birds, or even if, you know, even if you don't have the lake there, if you're um, walking along like the Danza trail on San Cruz river, you'll get a really wide variety of bird species there. Um, and a lot of it just has to do with the water and the food resources. Let me see if I can, uh, I'm going to stop my share and, Let me uh, try to do this one more time here. Okay. So I'll show you this way. Go to explore on eBird. And uh, you're going to, if you go to explore hotspots, these are all, so the, the deeper the red, the higher diversity of hotspots. So hotspots being like different parks in the area or different canyons, that type of thing. So again, let's scroll down in Southeast Arizona, which is a very, it has very high variety of bird species. Um, but you can see anywhere that there's water, there's going to be greater diversity. So this, the deeper, the red or orange or yellow. So red being will be the highest diversity. You can see here on the bottom, right? Species observed the dark red all the way from 500 plus down to the gray, which is zero blue being 50 to 100. You can see that, um, a lot of the, the points that are out like in the desert areas will be, uh, that blue or lighter green other than like, why is this spot right here? Why is it so, um, why is there so much diversity right here? Well, it's a wastewater treatment plant. <laughs> so there's water there. Um, and so when you're looking for new places to go, think about where is there water? And that's where you'll have higher diversity. All right, let's move on. Let me go back to sharing the PowerPoint. Okay. So... Many times when we think about birding, we think visually about seeing the bird. When we were describing wood duck, we were talking about how it looks just like out of this world and like all the colors, surf scoter, the, all the colors of the bill. You know, we think about the colors, we think about visually seeing the bird. Well, one thing that you want to keep in mind as you get into birding is that it's not just seeing the bird, it's also, uh, audio it's what you hear and so it's this is not something that i learned right away uh, it's something i learned more in my like mid to late 20s where i kind of picked up the idea the um picked this up from uh, other 
birders that began to um, realize that, wow, got to listen for birds. It took me so long to ever even know what a soar was until I realized, oh, that's what I've been hearing. So he, here's what a soar is. This, this little bird is a soar. It's um, pretty common at Sweetwater, but you hardly ever see them. The thing is that they love to make noise. Here's what they sound like. They sound like a dolphin. Check this out. One of my favorite sounds ever, really, by the way, is like being out in the marsh and hearing these like dolphins coming at me, like all these different sores everywhere. And then you have Virginia rails that are nearby and they're doing their pig grunting and you hear red winged blackbirds singing in the marshes. And um, I didn't really, I mean, I experienced that uh, when I was younger and first into birding, but I didn't really realize how important it was to be able to pick up new birds or think through like what's around by me by just listening. And so the sooner you start using your ears, the better. Now, some of us have better ears than others. Uh, honestly, I, I don't have great ears, but some, some of these birds really do stand out, uh, with their, with their calls. And so it's easier to pick up. Like if you're, uh, wanting me to listen for golden crown kinglet or grasshopper sparrow, uh, that's going to be a lot harder. My ears like getting that high pitched stuff is just not, I just can't pick that up as well. Even like orange crown sparrow is like really tough, but still I can really hear heel woodpeckers. I can hear ladderback woodpeckers. I can hear song sparrows. I, I can hear soras. I can hear red till hawks when they're calling i can hear kestrels doing their little call um purple martins flying over i can't hear cliff swallows but i can hear purple martins but still just as much as i can like trying to use my ears to pinpoint where things are at and to be mindful of what's around me i talked a little bit about patagonia lake and just like how great the diversity is there so this is a picture of patagonia lake state park from the um the birding trail and looking out over the marsh and there's no you don't see any birds in this picture right unless you have better eyes than me i can't find a single bird out here but i can just like feel the presence of birds around me as i look at it i hope you can too just kind of put yourself there pretend we're at patagonia lake state park and we're we're checking this out and then um let's think i'm gonna play uh a call and just kind of think through it, and um, then we'll talk about what you hear here. Here we go. All right. What are some birds that you heard in that? Or what, what are some sounds that you heard? Anyone able to pick out any species there? Red-winged blackbird. Red blackbird. Yeah, that's a big one that stands out, right? Red-winged blackbird. So like, so you hear that and then you can start looking around for it. You can kind of be aware of it. So uh, where would you, if you have red-winged blackbird and you don't see it yet, where, where would you start looking? Probably reeds. Cattails. Yeah. Yeah. The cattails and in the reed, just kind of looking for movement, anything like that. Anyone else hear anything, anything different in that? I'll play. Morning, I'm gonna, oh yeah. Yeah. Okay. Good. Who said that? Laurel. Hey, Laurel. Yeah. White winged dove. I think I heard a Northern Cardinal in there too. Oh wow! <laughs> I'll play it again because it's just kind of it's it's good to it's like listen. Just we'll just like listen one more time here. Oh, white wing, that's right.
They might have heard a marsh wren in there. Anyone hear a marsh wren? Or what else did we hear? I, I wondered about that raspy sound with that. That was before the blackbird called. Is there a mockingbird? There might have been a mockingbird in there too, yeah. I thought we were all beginners. <laughs> I don't know. It's just like you start kind of thinking through like what these birds could be. And we, there's some birds in there that I, I can't even identify. But let, let's listen to some other calls and just kind of put ourselves there and be like, we don't have to identify what they are, but just like thinking about listening. Here, here's another one that we can listen to. That's a that's a marsh wren calling, and here's a is another one. Danita, I'm gonna put you on the spot. What bird what bird family is that is that from? Just bird family. What do you think? Play it again. I'm sorry. I was dealing with the chat. <laughs> I was I don't know. I'm failing this test. I'm gonna say uh I don't know. It's a, a, either a gnat catcher or a wren, but I think I'm wrong. You might be wrong. It was a thick billed kingbird. Sorry, I just put you on this. And see, the, and all of us would consider Danito a great birder. I, at least I would. At least I would. We don't have to know everything, but like listening to it and then like trying to get like the directional of it and just like trying to find it. And then when you find it and you can see it calling it at the same time. Boom, that's when a lot of learning really happens, right? So you don't even need to know what family these birds are, are that are calling around you, but like hearing it, like picking up what direction it is, finding if you can find it, that's harder than it is sometimes, sometimes it's harder than other times. But if you can find the bird and see it singing, there's something in your learning process, mental process that if you can see it singing and you're hearing it at the same time, it just like cements that bird into your, into your mind. So, um, I, th I think it's really important, like, especially if you're at your, your, it's easier to do it, your patch because you know the area well, and you can kind of know the spot where you can kind of sit and just kind of watch this stuff and begin to hear the bird and then try to find it and see, watch it sing or watch it call. And you just, it, you learn a lot in that process. So uh, this is my friend, Matt. You can see he's got a lot of different stuff going on with him right there. He's got a spotting scope next to him. He's got binoculars hanging from his neck. He's got his phone in his hand. Isn't that like most of us? We always have our phone in our hand. He's got sunglasses up. He's got to have, you can't really wear sunglasses when you're birding. That doesn't really fit. Um, but here he's got some different tools when it comes to birding that are kind of important. Now I'd say some of my best times out looking for birds, I don't have any of those things. I hardly ever carry a scope with me. I'm not really a scope person. I find it slows me down in trying to find the birds because I have to put the scope down and then you know carry it and all that. So if you see me out birding, most of the time it's just my my binoculars, and I do have my phone because my phone I, I use for different things like keeping my list or sometimes listening to different bird calls stuff like that. Um, but sometimes you don't even need binoculars. I mean, there's a few times where you know I've been somewhere. Damn, I ox and i just kind of went out for a walk and i just enjoy the birds without anything um even so like when i, I go for walks with my wife around the neighborhood i'm not going to carry my binoculars around the neighborhood especially when i'm with my wife i want to focus on her but what happens 
inevitably as I'm distracted by the different birds that are around, I hear a northern mockingbird and I look up in the tree and I'm looking for it. And my wife gets about a hundred yards in front of me and I have to go run to catch up with her. Uh, but if you have a good pair of binoculars, that's really going to help. So let's talk about some of the equipment. We're not going to go into all the binoculars. This is, this is from our nature shop though. Like we have a really wide selection of binoculars to choose from. I want to tell you, you do not need a thousand dollar pair of binoculars to like have something to, to have everything you need. Actually, you can get a, a really nice pair of Vortex binoculars for around $150 or $200. Uh, even if that's too much, you can get a decent pair for $100, too. It's not, you don't have to break the bank to have like the latest and greatest. I mean, you certainly can. You can pick up these nice orange Swarovskis for a couple thousand dollars and be really happy if you have that money to spend. But mo most of us do not. You can just pick up the, the Vortex Diamondbacks over here on the left. Like those are super good. That's what my son uses and he's super happy with them. And I've used them before too. Um, for the longest time, you know, I use uh, a Bushnell pair that was not very good at all, but it certainly got me through like 10, 15 years of birding and I thoroughly enjoyed it. So, but having something that does uh, a pair of binoculars to help you to look like that, that's, that's, I would almost say it's vital. It's like a, it's an important thing. So having, having a pair that you're happy with that fits you, uh, and fits your budget, um, like that's, that's a, a good place to start. Uh, it, sometimes you can kind of be inundated with all sorts of different types of binoculars and all that. You can come into our shop and we can help you out. No problem at all. No problem. Uh, be, beyond binoculars, excuse me. There's a couple different apps on your phone that I want to just kind of alert you to. One of them, uh, I've been talking about eBird a lot. Uh, I love eBird. It's one of my favorite things. Um, just, uh, I, I wish I had it when I was a kid. Like that would have been awesome. I would have been keeping lists all the time. But here, this is what the eBird app looks like on your, your right. Like when you want to uh, submit a checklist we have different um, workshops and stuff to help you with all of that. So won't get, get into the nitty gritty of that right now, but just be aware it's a free app that you can download on your phone. It helps with like keeping track of the birds that you see. It's very, very nice. The app on the left is put out by Cornell lab as well, but it's called Merlin. Now Merlin is a fairly, fairly new, but uh, it's fairly, it's more than fairly awesome. It's a, it's a real deal. So you see this thing called sound ID. You can click on the sound ID and it records all the different calls that from your phone recorder, all the bird calls all around. And then um, if you have the right packs uploaded, then it'll start giving you ideas of what these bird calls are. So you start playing it and all of a sudden like a black tailed gnat catcher pops up. And, Verdant calls and Verdant pops up. So what I can't remember what that uh, app is like. If you hear a, a song and you put put it this app and it listens to the song, it tells you like what song it is. Can't remember what what the name of that app is, but it's the same sort of thing except with bird calls. It's amazing, and so it also has a photo ID thing to where like if you ha take a picture of a bird, you can put the photo I you. Know, put that picture of the bird into this photo ID and it gives you ideas of what the bird could be. Uh, and then down here, it's got an explore function to where you can like, it pulls up some of that data from the eBird that you can look at and then identify. You can download a bird pack of like Southeast Arizona birds. And it acts like a bird book on your phone, complete with uh, calls of birds, songs of birds, range maps, all sorts of stuff. It's a wealth of information. And I believe the Merlin app is free. Yeah. It, the Merlin app is free. So it's, it's pretty incredible. I would recommend getting both of those. Actually my wife and a lot of my friends who are just getting into birds, they love this Merlin app and it's like pushing them full throttle into the birding world. I love it. So here, here's another tip. 
use birding as an excuse to visit new places. Um, you know, we love to travel. I think that's just kind of like a natural thing for a lot of us who are inquisitive and like love to see new things. Uh, any place that you go and travel to new birds. Uh, so like, it's, it's awesome. Like traveling is, is fantastic when you're a birder, but there's so many different birding hotspots around Southeast Arizona. Like you could spend all year to go and like find, go to all these different little hot spots and do a bird list at all of them. It just gives you an excuse to go and, and check out new places. I think that's one thing I really like about birding. I've talked a little bit about lists. I would say one of the fun things to do as a new birder is to start a list, uh, with a life list, a, you know, someone brought up like, Hey, what about doing, having my yard as a patch, start a yard list. It's really cool. Like when, you have, uh, you're outside and you're gardening all of a sudden a peregrine falcon flies over like, Oh, I've never seen that for my, in my yard before I got to start an eber list now. So you do like eber list and you get your peregrine falcon on your, on your yard list. Um, I started keeping lists when I was a kid. So like, um, this is a, this, uh, one with the spotted sandpiper. This is a bird book that my parents got me that when I was a kid and I saw a bird for the first time, my mom would write something in there with the date where I was and what I was doing when I saw the bird. It's really cool to look back at that. And, you know, uh, this is, uh, May 30th, 1987 fishing Clark's Creek with daddy is when I saw a spotted sandpiper, uh, for the first time. Now, uh, some of us are older, so maybe it's not as cute as that would be, but, uh, still like it's, it's cool to be able to look back at that and like, have like those, uh, those memories. And that's what birding can do is like, it leads to a lot of memories. So I really encourage you to do that. Here's some other different, there's all sorts of different ways to keep lists. These, it's a life list. So like I just wrote in there went the first time I saw, these different birds and what I, I love the note portion of like who I was with or what I was doing. So like zone tailed hawk, June 30th, 2009, that's the first time I ever came to Tucson in Southeast Arizona. And, uh, the notes with Jolene near incinerator Ridge, uh, Ferruginous Hawks with the Zooks and Mike Roper on March 12th, 2014. So like, it's really cool. Like, uh, some of you might make it into my journal sometime, you know, seeing, with Donito Burgess at Sweetwater Wetlands, who knows, like that sort of thing. And then, um, day list, you know, you do, we don't have to write out as much anymore. Now that we have eBird, but that's how I used to do it. But I think they're kind of lists are fun. Uh, one way to yeah, derive enjoyment from burning. And here's what I really want to leave you all with as we wrap up here. Remember, we're going to have two more sessions of this. Our next session is going to focus on families of birds and how to identify families of birds. This, this right off the bat, I didn't want to jump right into how to identify birds. This is more like, Hey, this is, this is the enjoyment of birds. Like enjoyment of birds is not all about identifying. All right. Enjoyment of birding has as much to do with the people and just like your, um, your inner enjoyment, anything else. All right. But Hey, here's, here's what I found. I have learned the best just by going out, being with other birders, being with other people. This is me leading a group of, of folks out at Sweetwater. We're pointing at something. I don't know what we're pointing at, but it must've been something really good. And all these different people, even though I was leading the trip, all these other people who are out here on this trip made me a better birder. So every time I go out at Sweetwater with other people, I just like kind of like being, uh, you know, it's like iron sharpens iron. All right. So like when you're out there with other people, even if you have only been birding for five minutes, you're going to make the other person a better birder by asking the right questions. All right. So ask questions when you're with other people. And if you're with the right people, they, they won't mind you asking a lot of questions. In fact, they'll enjoy it because it makes them better. Um, I find that, uh, so when I, I told you my grandparents got me into birding, my cousin's grandparents, when I was about nine, 
I, we moved away from them. I didn't spend as much time with them. I pretty much birded on my own other than like other people who probably wouldn't consider themselves birders, even though they probably are like my parents or, you know, other people, they go outside with me and spend time with me. But like, I didn't really have any other birder friends until I was probably like 27 or 28. And that's when I met a guy named Richard Rep when I was walking the Yakima Arboretum and I was just walking around by myself with my binoculars. He comes up to me, this older guy. And he's like, are you, uh, are you birding? I'm like, why? Well, yes, I am. Yes, I am. I'm birding, uh, looking for, for birds. And he said, well, have you seen the Western screech owl? And I was like, no, I haven't seen the screech owl. That sounds cool. He's like, would you like me to take you over there and show it to you? And I was like, by all means, let's go over there. And so Richard walks me over there and he showed me this screech owl. And he's like, have you ever been a part of a Christmas bird count? I'm like, no, but I've heard about them. It sounds so cool. And he's like, well, come and join us. Uh, Chris bird count was in a month or so. And so I went and joined them and it, it just took off from there. I started birding with these other people and I just learned so much. And I find that, see that, that would have been 2000, uh, 19, what year is it? 2008, I guess is about when it would have been. So uh, what's that? 12, I, I can't do math. 15 years, 15 years uh, of finally birding with other people. And I still find that every time I go out with folks, whether they're new or I've been birding forever, like I just learned so much. And so if you're on your own, um, it's okay, but it's better when you're with other people. Now, sometimes you just want to get out and bird by yourself, but to grow and to learn and to immerse yourself in birding with other people, like that's a, that's the place to be. So I just really want to encourage you to do that and, and go from there. So with that being said, we'll have some time for some questions too. And the next session we'll get into bird families, how to identify like different things, differences between finches and sparrows, fly catchers. And then we'll get into another session about like, when you go to a specific place, how do you go about birding that place? So how, like if you're uh, dropped off at Fort Little Park, where do you walk to go find the birds and how do you find them? Those would be the next two sessions. But before then, Think about these two things. What's your patch? What's your place? All right. What's your place? And I want to encourage you to bird it. I say twice this week. If you can just make it like once a week up until December, when we meet again for the next session of this, I want to hear a little bit about it from you guys. Tell me what you began to notice. You're going to the same place over and over and you know, maybe keeping a list, maybe keeping notes of like what you see. And then also, if you have an opportunity to sign up for a field trip with us, please do so. Whether it's one of the specific brand new to birding uh, field trips that we're doing, or maybe outside of that. The Sweetwater trips are a great spot for you too. So um, do that, Go get out birding with some other people and just know that when you do that, and ask the right questions, uh, listen, listen to uh, uh, the birds, watch the other birders and what they're doing and where they're looking, all different levels of, of uh, you know, up in the air, on the ground for quail, in the middle for warblers. Um, but just keep, just kind of be, uh, uh, be mindful of when you're with other birders and watch what they do a little bit too. So a good mix of asking questions and watching, uh, I find is, is a really good, uh, opportunity for learning. Any, any questions here that we could hit here at the end before we specifically wrap up? I'll put myself on mute, Danito. Yeah, I've got a few questions for you. Um, real quick, before I get to the questions, I do want to say, um, in the chat, um, Jesse Tennyson, um, Jesse actually joins us for a lot of our virtual events. Um, they work with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. In the chat, they put a link to a uh, another virtual event that's happening tomorrow that 
Um, it'll talk about Sparkburn. So if you're interested in that, you can click on that link. Um, and then I've got a few questions. Um, so Kat, um, Kat was wondering, do the species that only migrate through Arizona and don't stay here for more than a few days, do those count towards the 500 plus species in the Arizona state list? If they're only here for just a short amount of time. Yep, they they certainly do. Um, yeah, so whether it's a breeding bird or a wintering bird or anything in between, I suppose, you know, if it's been sighted through Arizona, then it's going to be on like um, the Arizona bird list. Wonderful, thank you. Um, and then Anna Marie has two questions. I'll just go ahead and give them both to you real quick. Um, she asks, first off, have red-winged blackbirds migrated or are they still common at Sweetwater? They were everywhere during May and June, and the last time that they were there, they didn't see any. Um, and then real quick, just you can answer this one as well. Um, when you're doing Merlin and if you travel to other states, do you need to download those state packs when you're traveling? I'll hit the last one. Uh, first so yeah anytime I go to a new state or area I'll download the bird pack uh, so like um, like I said last year I went up in the northeast went to like Maine and New York and all that so I downloaded those packs uh, once I left I knew I wasn't going to be going back for a while so I just deleted those so I wouldn't be holding up a, like a lot of different data on my phone but I do like to download those ahead of time when I went to Ecuador in September, I downloaded the Ecuador one. Holy cow, that took forever to download. Um, but you want to make sure you do that ahead of time, too. That way you're not frustrated when you get out there and you're like, oh, man, I don't want the pack download. So thinking ahead of time is always really good. Um, and then uh, for uh, regarding red-winged blackbirds as we water. So red-winged blackbirds will be um, year-round residents uh, in our area. I know like um like the mid upper midwest they they migrate out of there and come back in the spring here they'll be year round uh but they do have patterns of of movement based on where the food resources are at or, or where they're not now uh sweetwater wetlands has kind of gone in and out as far as available food resources, you know, when it was drained for a while, not as many food resources. Um, and so after the burn, actually this past Wednesday, I had a, a quite a, probably the most red-winged blackbirds I've seen there in a little while, which I was really excited about, some yellow-headed too. That was this past Wednesday. But then when I went on Saturday morning, I had just like, I think I had like somewhere between five and 10 red-winged blackbirds, hardly any. So um, I don't really know what's going on with the pattern there right now. I would say definitely they're a lot more uh, in your face and vocal and apparent back in uh, the early to late spring when they're doing all their breeding. And I would say right now, since they aren't breeding, they aren't as apparent at Sweetwater. I'd have to go back to my list and kind of see if that's been the same pattern in October, um, September, October, November, uh, for the past few years. Um, but I do think it has changed a little bit and I haven't been able to put my finger, finger on exactly why same with yellow headed blackbirds just don't see as many of them right now as we used to. So I wish I had a better answer for that. All right. Thank you, Lee. Got a few more questions for you. Um, so Greg asked, uh, you know, I noticed that, you know, sometimes you'll say go out to your patch and burn it. Um, and so Greg was asking, what do you mean when you say burn it? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. All right. Thank you, Greg, for catching me on that. Um, what does it mean to burn it? That's actually a really good question. So <clears throat> it's a very active word, right? Like, um, bird, it's a, it's a, it's a verb to like go out and, and bird the area. So I guess the difference between like someone going out and enjoying Fort Lowell park and seeing the vermilion flight, got this vermilion flight catcher right here in front of us, um, seeing the vermilion flight catchers at Fort Lowell park and enjoying them 
uh, as opposed to going to Fort Lowell Park with the distinct intention to go and look for birds. I guess that would be the, the, what I would say, if I'm going to go bird in area, it means I more than likely will or should bring my binoculars. And my intention going there would be to specifically look for birds, not really to go and watch my son play baseball or um, to go walk the dog. Like I'll be intently focused on looking for birds, which means that um, instead of just walking aimlessly around, I'm positioning myself in places around the park where bird life is more active, whether it's around the pond or around the edges. And I'm actively looking for flight movement in the trees or listening for bird calls. And it's more of an intentionality, I think more than anything. Now that I think about it. Yeah. It's an intentionality of like, all right, I'm going to this place specifically to look for birds for 30 minutes. And then the rest of the time I'll just enjoy myself there in a different way or something like that. <clears throat> I hope that that kind of answers answers that and i think it's an intentionality part excellent um deanna has a question um she was asking about kind of those physical journals that you were showing where you had written things down um do you have like a journal like that that you would suggest um that has kind of like where you were and notes like that that you like using yeah 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 for sure so um this one right here on the right is actually just like some, you can see the date right here, Saturday, January 30th. It's like a uh, vertical right here. So this is like some calendar date book thing that my grandma gave me. It's probably from like 1977 or something. I don't know, but it's, so th this is, this is not something that you really, so like we put, I remember grandma doing these vertical and, horizontal this graph lining thing for me in this date book so that's nothing there but the one on the left i'm trying to remember uh the name of this book this is like a uh like a life list book so if we go to um i should be able to find it pretty quick if we just go to like oh not google maps what am i doing let's go here let's just do like um bird life list um book <clears throat> i bet it'll bring up the one that i have oh it's this one right here so the sibley birders life list here and field diary i believe this is the one i have uh let's look at the sample here all right well mm. let me Yeah, yeah, it's the same one. So you can see like it has the name of the bird species. This is uh, specific to uh, the United States, North America. So it has the name of the bird. You can put the date and location and then notes on it. So the Sibley Birders Life List and Field Diary. I, I do know it's something that we carry in our shop if, if that's uh, uh, of interest to you. Uh, but I have... Uh, my wife got this book for me a while ago. I probably need to go through and update it because it's probably been, I, I think I've added a couple of birds this year that I haven't put in there, but it's really cool to be able to put that in there and uh, look back in the journal part of it. It's a fun little, fun little diary. Um, so even diaries are not just for teenage girls. <laughs> Any other th thoughts there, Danito? Let's see. Um, well, I can just answer this one. So Kat had asked, um, when do field trips become available? Um, so all of our field trips are available on the second Saturday of the preceding month. They come open at 7 a.m. So, for example, the December field trips, they will open up for registration at 7 a.m. on this coming Saturday. Um, and she was talking about the Patagonia Sonoida field trip. And you're right, Kat, that one does fill up extremely fast. Um, I kind of joke, you know, we have some of our field trips that 
uh, kind of go like Rolling Stones tickets. They're so uh, popular. You kind of have to be online really right when they open up. Um, but just going forward, that's how you know. They're basically the second Saturday of the preceding month at 7 a.m. They'll open up. And, and the cool thing about the, the these two trips that we're putting together for the brand new to birding series is just for you guys. So like there's no danger of it filling up. Uh, unless like all of you, like, I, I guess I can't take 70 people or a hundred people out, but pretty much like if you want to join, like it, you're, you're set to go for it. Um, any other, uh, questions before we wrap up that you want to ask verbally before we, uh, sign out here? Yeah. And just remember, this is the first of two, the others will be a little bit more, um, uh, like specific with bird ID and and that type of stuff so i just before anybody unmute I had one last question from gary um gary first off thank you for the extremely nice things you wrote uh we really appreciate it we try hard so thank you very much um but gary was just saying he goes to sweetwater a lot um and he thinks he's been kind of disappointed lately not only how it looks um but he th feels like there's been less birds compared to um years past and he kind of thinks the same thing about Madera Canyon. Is that something that you have been seeing as well? Or is that just maybe kind of um, unfortunate that Gary's kind of had that bad luck? Well, I, I'd say from a Sweetwater perspective, um, there there's it seems to be a lot of birds there right now. Um, in fact, I would, I would call it pretty, pretty birdie, if I could say that, um, that uh, there's some rare warblers there right now. There's decent numbers of ducks. All the ducks are kind of back down for the wintering grounds yet. Um, good numbers of black Phoebes and vermilion flycatchers. Um, so I, I feel like numbers are pretty good there at Sweetwater. You know, it's definitely different than what it was, um, you know, seven years ago or whatever, but things change and, you know, um, they did just do the burn recently, which, is a good thing, but there's also some drawbacks to it. So uh, learning different ways to uh, restore and take care of that uh, habitat there. And then as far as Madera Canyon, you know, it goes through cycles of, um, you know, how many birds are there. Um, the winter birding in Madera Canyon is always a little bit slow because it's higher elevation. And then, um, but, you know, I, I would say that there's probably like it hasn't, I would say that I think it's fair to say for everywhere that um, numbers of birds have gone down. That's that's a fact that we've uh, have to come to realize that uh, because of the habitat loss, because of uh, all sorts of different um, issues that are happening not not just here, but uh, birds breeding grounds, birds wintering grounds. There's just fewer birds, and so that's why that's one reason why I'm part of Tucson Audubon is, you know, cause we, uh, want, need to play our role in protecting, uh, habitat and protecting birds. And our whole goal is to inspire people to do that, inspire people to protect, inspire people to enjoy the birds. And so being part of a, a bigger, uh, group like this is one way that, uh, I, I think that is important for us to jump on board and be a part of, um, you know, preserving habitat and taking care of the birds that we have. Um, so I, I think that's important. I, and I do think I see that a little bit with Madera Canyon. I think with um, Sweetwater, it's just a matter of uh, time of day that you're there, time of year. Uh, right now, it's pretty good. Well, thank Excellent. you, guys. Go for it, Danito. Um, so, yeah, so thank you all so much. Um, really appreciate the active chat, um, all the questions. Um, these things work a lot better when people participate like y'all have. So thank you so much for that. Um, like Luke said, um, this is the first of three parts. Um, so we hope you've signed up for the next two. If not, you can find those on our website. Um, also, you know what? I'll just include a link to them today in my follow-up email. Um, and then lastly, because we record all of these, if you had to step away or if you want to go back and watch anything over, this whole recording will be on our YouTube channel by the end of the day, um, which, again, we'll have a link in that wrap-up email from there. Um, so with that...
Let me just make sure nobody has any last second questions. And I think they're clear on the chat. Um, so I want to thank Luke. Um, I always invite everybody at the end of these to uh, unmute themselves and give a personal thank you to our presenter. I know they always appreciate that. Um, so feel free to do that at this time. And thank while y'all are doing that, I'll thank stop you. Thanks very much. Thank, thank you so much. much. Thanks, guys. See you later.